In the last two years, my wife and I have been in a ferocious debate over what to do with our aging cat. We've started to leave deposits everywhere in the house, on the furniture, um, on the floor, everywhere. We have a toddler running around in there, and the house is very small. We've checked out all the other options, um, apart from having him euthanized, i.e. getting him adopted, offering him to other people, there's just no options. And we reached some sort of an impasse whereby we kind of figured, well, we've run out of options and something's got to be done now. Um, I am a supporter of euthanasia, and I'm a supporter of euthanasia even in humans and in animals, etc. Um, but still, for various emotional reasons, I think anyone who has a pet can understand this, although it's not very rational. I told my wife, okay, if you want to take the ultimate step with him and have him put down, then you're going to have to leave me out of the entire process. I don't want to be involved in any way. I know that that's just moral abdication, but there you are. That's, you know, humans, emotions work that way, right? Um, it doesn't make me any less culpable, but I feel better about the fact that, all right, I, I'm not the one to actually initiate all this quite hypocritical as well, but I, I also think that it's not all that uncommon in humans to feel that way about their pets and decisions like this. Um, now, um, we took him in, we took the cat in. Now remember, I had had no contact with the veterinarian. We took the cat in on Saturday. I stayed in the car with my infant, my son, while... Um, my wife went in and spoke to the vegeta vegetarians, to the veterinarians. Uh, my wife doesn't speak uh, English; isn't her first language. In fact, it's her third language. And she mentioned she talked it over with the um, veterinarians, and she came back out and said, "There's a problem. I don't really understand what the issue is." So okay, I walked in. Now I walked in to the veterinary clinic cold, as it were, because I didn't know any communication that had been taking place. I wasn't party to any communication that had taken place between my wife and the vets from the get-go. As far as I, were con I was concerned, it was just a done deal that all the preliminaries had been taken care of, and it was just a question of us dropping the poor little fellow off and uh, filling out the appropriate paperwork and me paying the fee. Um, now, an interesting thing happened. My wife went in, spoke to them, came back out with the cat and said, you have to go in there and talk to them. So I go in and I talk to them. And they say, well, we have other options, you know. Uh, you don't have to just have him killed. And I said, oh, really? So you, you think that he's salvageable or whatever? So I was kind of delighted by this, um, that maybe we can just... Um, you know, maybe I was just being too pessimistic. I thought he was so far gone, and I thought that this had been discussed already between my wife and the vets over the phone or whatever, because, as I say, I just wasn't involved. Um, <clears throat> now, they mentioned this, and I kind of felt like I had now had an excuse to take a hard line with my wife and say, no, no, he's fine. We, we don't have to have him put down. All we've got to do is have his poop and pee issues fixed. And he's, you know, free to wander around our tiny house, get underfoot, as he's always done. An interesting thing happened, though, when I went out into the parking lot to break this news to my wife. Um, somebody had overheard this in the vet's office. And this person started to scream at me. You cat killer, you, maybe I should kill you you piece of shit, all this kind of thing. Just rage. Now, I found out later that this person had just been in there to have their dog put under, and the dog was on his last legs, and the person might not have been at their best. I wasn't at my best either that day, and it resulted in a shouting match between myself and this person in the parking lot of the veterinary office, veterinary clinic. Now, I was angry and upset, but at a couple of moments during our interaction, I was pretty hard put not to burst out laughing at the insanity of the situation. As 
far as I could tell, this individual just assumed that I just wanted to have my cat killed and I didn't really give a damn about, you know, anything else. And, you know, this person doesn't know anything about my past and how attached I am to my cat and um, how it was an enormously painful decision uh, to do this and how delighted I was when the vet told me that it was okay, that the, that the we can now actually probably help the pet, help my cat, um, to live a few more years without him shitting everywhere or pissing everywhere. Um, but all this was kind of lost on the individual who started to scream at me in the parking lot. Um, threatening to kill me, um, all this sort of thing. Now, remember, the guy was, you know, he was in the same boat as I was, but he reacted very differently instead of with sadness, which was my overwhelming, and, and huh, yes, guilt, <laughs> which were my overwhelming emotions, you know, um, you know, poor fellow, you know, I've really, you, I've, I'm really going to miss you, and you were part of my life for 15 years, etc., etc. Um, <clears throat> but this guy was reacting with red-faced, foam-at-the-mouth, violent rage. favorite subject of mine... Oh, you didn't try to actually pick a fight. <laughs> I'm 6'1", and I'm 230 pounds, and this guy was a lot smaller than me, and he jumped out of his car, and when he realized how much bigger I am than him, he suddenly calmed down a bit, and his wife started to scream, and they just drove off. Anticlimax, really, except for the fact that, well, I called the police, and I um, also... Um, mentioned my concerns over confidentiality to the veterinary department or the veterinary um, regulatory bodies here in Canada and the vet's kind of in trouble. <clears throat> but that's not really the issue. The issue is um, my old um, interest which is ethics by denunciation. Um, I have a day kind of touches on this with his videos on vegetarianism and ethics where he questions whether or not people are sincere. Um, Nietzsche says that Christianity is really just hatred masking as love. And I tend to agree with him there. Um, I think that denouncing evildoers is an act of hatred. Um, actually caring about those who suffer and feeling sad and empathetic towards them is an act of love. Righteous indignation is nothing but hate. It's, um, you know, you just, you can use your, you can do a deal with your conscience. And let's be honest, we all do this to a certain extent, right? We all make deals with our conscience, right? Um, so, what the issue to me is being able to subvert one's emotions or channel one's proper emotions into something less noble without even realizing it, without people even realizing it, how they've become sidetracked, um, how they've allowed their emotions to sort of get sidetracked in that way. Um, is an interesting sort of comment on how reliable our feelings are, right? When does love become hate? And can are there situations in which you don't even notice it? You don't even notice that approving of that SOB getting what you know he deserves um, takes over from your actual feeling of loss and sadness or... Um, feelings of compassion when does this when does the scale get tipped that way when does the out, when do the outward trappings of love i.e. say Christianity or martyrdom or righteous indignation or whatever when does that tip over into the toxic I came across an interesting quote by Aldous Huxley um, of the brave new world and heaven and hell and that sort of thing. Um, to be able to destroy with good conscience 
to be able to be able to behave badly and call your bad behavior righteous indignation this is the height of psychological luxury the most delicious of moral treats um, righteous indignation and ethics by denunciation and all that entails um, Huxley seems to think that the person who's doing this probably knows that they're doing it. But I wonder sometimes. Um, I looked at the guy who was frothing at the mouth and with his veins bulging, threatening to kill me when I brought my cat in to be euthanized, and I think several things. First of all, he was simply wrong the way he sized up the situation. I wasn't treating a veterinary office like a little kitty Auschwitz. We had actually thought this through for years. And, you know, as far as he was concerned, I suppose, we were just blithely saying we're tired of feeding this cat, so we're just going to have him killed. Um, <clears throat> so his sizing up of the situation was wrong, I presume, unless he had just lost control of himself and he just was randomly reacting, um, which I think is probably the case. But it's interesting, though. Instead of breaking down and crying in his car... Uh, he chose to go the hate and aggression route. I've often said this, and I will repeat it again. Doing what is right is one thing. Denouncing those who do wrong is quite another entirely. Um, or even hating or harming people who do wrong is quite another entirely. In fact, I would say that it kind of ties in with the Nietzschean or even Kierkegaardian idea of ressentiment, where your emotions are hijacked and you might not even be aware of what's taking place inside of you know, your own head. Christianity, I find, is very good at this, in dangling all these lovely things in front of you to build up this wonderful ideal, and then they turn your head around to look at the real world, and you see that the real world doesn't match up to these ideals. So what do you do with the fact that ideal and real rarely coincide? Do you just say, well, that's life, and that's unfortunately the way the world is, and human beings are imperfect, etc., etc.? Or do you get really angry and start swinging your fists at people in veterinarians' parking lots. Um, and how does the individual who is involved, who is being led around by the nose, as it were, by their emotions, how does that person even understand when the tip tipping point has taken place? As I say, you look through the history of Christianity and it's replete with denunciation of evildoers. And all the stuff, if you look at, say, the Spanish Inquisition, one is in inclined to think that the people who were running the Spanish Inquisition knew what they were doing. All that they were doing was creating a totalitarian kind of proto-Stalinist kind of state that basically required a large crop of thought criminals to burn at the stake in order to maintain a heightened sense of tension in society, um, to maintain the absolute power of the monarch and his clique, the nobles. That's the general view, if you ask me, of the Spanish Inquisition. But there's the other side of the coin. What if they believed all of this? <clears throat> what if de Torquemada actually thought that he was doing the right thing, and he honestly believed that um, heretics are evil people who know that they're evil, but they consciously choose to do the wrong thing? Um, what if he actually believed that this was the case. Could we really fault him? Um, it's just a question of whether or not we believe that he was sincere, right? Well, I can say what I want about the guy who threatened to kill me the other day. Um, but he looked pretty darn sincere. He looked as though he looked as though he was looking directly at evil in in it, uh, you know, evil itself, me. Me. Now, it's not the first time people have concluded that I'm fundamentally evil. 
Um, and as I say, when I actually looked at it that way, my mind can sort of switch perspectives quickly, even in the heat of the moment. And even while, when I'm in a shouting match with somebody, a little part of me, as I said, was kind of giggling and thinking, this guy has just been, in a sense, kidnapped by his own id or whatever, because he just doesn't, or perhaps I guess is super ego, for to speak in Freudian terms. Um, he doesn't even realize what's happened here. He loves his dog. The loss of his dog has led him to hatred. Um, I would say that that almost compounds the problem. In fact, it definitely does compound the problem. Um, first of all, he didn't know all the facts, right? He didn't have all the facts. He didn't see the years of agonizing, I guess, or negotiating between myself and my wife over what we're going to do with this cat, what the situation, whether the cat situation or whatever. He didn't know that this was a very painful thing for us to do. Um, and he didn't know that, um, you know, there was just a language barrier and uh, this sort of thing. He may have overheard stuff that he wasn't supposed to overhear or whatever. But none of that really mattered in the heat of the moment. His emotions were the impetus behind um, his decision to act, if it was even a decision. is it a, Was he acting or was he reacting? Um, I don't think that it was a conscious decision on his part to lose his cool and start uttering, uttering death threats. Um, but something happened and he lost control of himself. And something got control of him. What would that be? Would you say that love got a, got a hold of him? Or hate? Which of the two is it? I'm going to go with hate. I'm going to go with Nietzsche. Where some sort of tipping point can take place in our minds that is very, very difficult for us to perceive. Especially when our emotions are kind of in extremis, right? How do we know what our own motives are, um, let alone the motives of others? How are we equipped to judge? How are we equipped to get, like, let's say we accept the idea of righteous indignation. How are we, how equipped are we to actually apply that idea? How do we know that we've sized the other person up accurately enough to hate them or enough to threaten them or whatever? Oh, I just need to know one or two little things, and that's all I need. Well, really. People are that easy to uh, read, are they? And um, people are simple, two-dimensional little TV screen type characters. Um, where you can actually tell all you need to know in the space of a 30-minute sitcom epi episode. Things aren't those that simple. Um, and... I think that the animal rights issue and the vegetarian issue and all that sort of thing, the ethics of it all, is one of those debates where it's very easy for people to lose their way. It's very easy for people to go from compassion, love, sadness, grieving, etc., into crusader-type hatred, um, de Torquemada-type denunciation. You are bad and even you know you're bad, and you have the option of not being bad, and you've chosen to be bad, okay, Monsieur de Torquemada, or Señor, or Monsignor, how do you know all of this? How do you know what makes up that person that you're just about to condemn to burn at the stake? Who made you God? That's why I think that it's always a bad idea to judge people. <laughs> um... First of all, I guess there are the obvious moral issues or whatever. Um, secondly, can you even do it? Do you have enough information? No, you don't have enough information, and I don't think anyone can have enough information. But people will do it anyway. And there is an enormous seduction in the whole thing. The height of psychological luxury, the most delicious of moral treats, you know. Behave badly and call your bad behavior righteous indignation. 
I don't know if that's actually your sentiment, although I suppose there are elements in it. But I certainly think that it's very apropos when it comes to the issue of ethics by denunciation. Beware of hate dolled up as love.